If you haven't yet, mark your song books to song number 325. Use that song of invitation after the lesson, 325. You know, it's not my phone, but it reminds me I need to make sure mine's on silent. It is, okay. Well, we're back on a Sunday evening again, as Dale pointed out earlier. Um, what we have been studying on Sunday nights online, I'll eventually get back to that, and we'll bring it into the sermon format, continue through 2 Corinthians. But tonight I wanted to continue the sermon that we began this morning looking at what I believe to be a workable solution to the world's problems, especially within our own country. But it's like anything else. When you have a collection of people, a group of people, in order to solve a problem, everybody's got to do their part. Everyone has got to step up and do what they should be doing. And the more people you have, the, more, the larger the group, the greater there is the, po the possibility that fewer will rise up to do what they're supposed to be doing. Um, when you look back in our country, and you go back a good number of years, you find that things were considerably different. And what I'm talking about is even on the level of work ethic. You know, some of y'all remember as kids growing up in the fields and doing hard daily work. And nowadays... You don't see that going on very much. There are hard workers. But there seems to be an idea within our culture today that seems to go counterintuitive to what we see within the Scriptures. One of, there are three things we covered this morning in looking at the question, what is the solution to the problems that we face within our world today? The first three we dealt with are these. We talked about love in the Lord. Let's start there. You know, if everybody would set it within their mindset to love the Lord their God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength, then they'll set about to live by the standards that he's given to us. And that'll go a long way of solving the issues. But let's go farther. We talked about loving your neighbors yourself. You know, one of the things that was presented when the COVID-19 virus first came to light, going back to sometime in March, what caused congregations to make the decision to not have services was this very point right here. Okay? We didn't know a lot about the virus at the time. We were learning about it. The things that we were, that we were hearing is that it was very contagious and it could be very deadly, depending on who called it. And so for the good of the congregation, for the good of other people, we were willing to say, okay, we're going to hold off services until we better understand things. Well, I would suggest take the same love your neighbor as yourself, as we talked about this morning, and apply it in the way that we deal with everybody within the world today. If we would, if, this is, if the world would abide by just these simple teachings of Jesus, it would be a much better place than what it has been within the last several months. And then the third thing that we talked about this morning had to do with respecting the law of the land. You know, people talk about our judicial system, our criminal system. You know, our prisons are overcrowded. What are we going to do about all this stuff? Well, if people quit breaking the law, that's half the problem, if not more than half the problem. Some people say, what about those rare instances where someone is falsely incarcerated? Okay, small number of people versus a whole lot of people. You know, it never does good to make decisions based on the few small little cases that are extraordinary, and it's never good to make decisions that affect everybody. One of the biggest arguments, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is about the discussion of abortion. Very simple. What about the case in point where the baby endangers the mother's life? What are you going to do about that? Okay, then we'll kill millions to save a handful of mothers. Is, is that, I mean, that's oftentimes the way these arguments run. So when we talk about the respect of the law of the land, we talked about the importance of having the proper attitude and raising our children up to respect the law of the land. You know, are there issues? Are there problems? Yes, there's problems. And let's get the right people in place to solve these problems. Let's increase accountability, you know, things of that nature. 
But if, if we would begin at home teaching our children to respect the law of the land, there would be fewer number of people that their police officers would have to encounter. Now, our next point will lead into, I'm going to say this lead into our next point, but one time in the conversation with a police officer, we were talking about children today, and how oftentimes children can be, can be very bratty, can be very disobedient, and it all goes down to the rearing of the, the, their rearing by their parents, and we were talking to the police officer about it. He said, well, we know there's a lot of cases like that. And here's what we tell the parents. If you don't deal with them today, we'll have to deal with them here in a couple of years. And that's what happens. The police know that these kids that are pro causing problems when they're 14, 15, 16 years old, at some point they're going to be causing problems on an older scale, and the police will have to deal with them then. So if we would teach the proper respect to get things in place, then we may have more children being raised to respect the law of the land. But what is the fourth solution then? And I think this one's very important. We need to get our homes in order. When I say we, I mean in general, the United States of America. We need to get our homes in order. If you were to compare the homes of today versus the homes of, let's say, 60 years ago, there's a drastic difference between the, what we see going on today and what, what we remember as children. And when our homes are in order, then we find things will begin to work in a much better fashion. But when the home is in disarray, what makes us think the nation itself is going to be any better? You know, the thing about the, the people who are running our nation today, most of them, some are older, I understand that, but most of them were probably children about 40 years ago. And the young people we're raising today, they're going to be serving in office in the next 15, 20, 30 years. And so we have to think about the importance of giving a solid foundation for our children. Now this is the Bible passage that Ron read for us for our scripture reading earlier. Turn back over to Colossians chapter 3. There are other passages we could consider, but this is a very simple and concise passage statement. Notice in Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 21 again. The Apostle Paul, and right into the church at Colossae, notice what he says. Very simply, he starts out, wives, submit to your own husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Now this is not a forced submission, this is by choice. And if you are a young lady, and you can never comprehend the idea of having to submit to your own husband, then don't get married. No one's forcing you to it. It's a choice. It's the role that you choose to take. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. If you don't think you can handle that, then don't get married. You're not going to be forced to do this. This is your choice as a Christian to have a proper home that God has so established. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Now think about this statement and who Paul is writing to. He doesn't say, now parents, force your children to obedience. I mean, there is a time and place for discipline, we understand that. But here he's telling children, old enough to comprehend this statement. It is incredibly simple. Obey your parents in the Lord in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Now, if, if I could say, raise your hand if you don't understand that, the only ones who would raise their hands would not understand the phrase, raise your hands, because they're too young to understand the phrase. But if you can understand the phrase, raise your hands, if you can understand the phrase, to obey your parents. Isn't it that simple? But then fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Now we bring it back around to the fathers again. Fathers, it's possible in your role as a dad to become a discouragement to your children. Think about this for just a moment. Our home needs, let's begin with, we need fathers who are loving and who are example-setting fathers. A father needs to be the type of example that his children, and, and this goes for the mother, we'll talk about the mom here in a minute, but the father needs to set the same example as, let's say, God has set for us. The same example where a child should be able to look up to their father and say, okay, I know that's the way I need to walk. That's the path I need to follow. Our homes need mothers that love the children and care for the children. And yes, 
set the right examples for them. Sadly, the reality is in the nation we live in today, there are so many homes that either don't have a father or don't have a father who, with the, an example worth anything. Or they have a mother. And the mother's not worth anything because she's chosen to be selfish and, and to follow the ways of the world and not care for her children. I'd love to tell you that, that there's only a handful of people that fit that pattern. But look at our system we live in today. And this isn't an intended to say, okay, kids, pat yourselves on the back because you have it very, you're very blessed, because you are. But we need to realize that this is what's in the world, and we need to do our best in our bubble, if you would, to be the right type of families for the world to look at and the world to follow. Firm, fair, and consistent discipline. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, kind of a parallel passage with what we just read. But notice there in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. He says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Sometimes I think we get lost in the whole debate about corporal punishment. Okay? People argue, should you, should you spank your child or should you not spank your child? Let, let's start with something else. How about we start just disciplining our children, period, telling them no. Telling them yes, giving them instructions from an early age. And whatever form of dis discipline you choose to use, you need to stick with it. You need to be consistent, it needs to be fair, and it needs to be firm. You know, you'll, you'll hear again the handful of bad examples of parents that have gone too far in the physical disciplining to the point of abuse. But that doesn't mean that it's not an adequate form of discipline. But the child needs to see it as that. I've, I have known some children that the physical discipline doesn't work very well. They're just too stubborn. But something else works well. And as a parent, you've got 18 years to figure that out. Well, really 12 years, I guess, you know. And then it starts going downhill depending on how good you did going uphill. And so we have to stop and think about what God expects of us within our homes and to get our homes right. And children, we need to have respectful children. Well, actually, let's talk about committed marriages. Committed marriages come before children, right? You're supposed to. Look in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 for a moment. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. The, uh, the writer says, Marriage is honorable among all in the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let's talk about this for just a moment. We talk about committed marriages. We're talking about one man, one woman for life. The day and age that we live in doesn't hold to that principle. And tragically, there are far too many people giving in to the carnal desires that we have too many, and we're going to say fatherless homes. There are too many people out there who have gotten themselves pregnant outside of wedlock. Some of them fix it, so to speak, by getting married and, and living their life properly. But far too often in this day and age, who needs to be married to have kids? There's not going to be a way that you have a great nation with that type of mentality. Homes need to be structured properly. It's like if you're going to have someone build you a house, there are certain codes that are put in place. My, my father is, is in the process of having to, to do termite repair on a house that was built many, many years ago when, when he was a, a kid. Now, they, they had no building codes. They set up a, a, a saw area, and they cut trees down, cut them out, built the house. And over the course of years, he expanded to it, shifted it, changed it, moved the stairs in different locations in the bathrooms, you know, all sorts of things. And anywhere there was oak, well, the wood's still good. But where there wasn't, well, the termites began to set in. So imagine if you hired someone to build you a house, and he followed the codes that they followed back then. There wasn't any. You know. And, it, and the house worked. It did good. But over the course of time... He's having to replace windows, having to rewire the electricity, just so many things that through the course of time begin to fail when proper patterns are not followed. Well, God has given us a pattern for the marriage relationship. 
It has given us a pattern for, for rearing children to bring them up in a way that, that, that is acceptable unto God and good for the children. If our nation would do that, if we would begin to look at our young people and say, they right now are the most important people in the world, and we've got a limited time to turn them in to well-adjusted, well-behaving adults, then we would begin to look at them as an incomplete process that we need to complete. And this is in no way detrimental to children at all. Just wait, one day you'll have a kid and you'll understand exactly what I'm saying. You have one shot at it. And so let's have committed marriages where the husband is faithful to the wife. The wife is faithful to the husband. Together they are faithful to the children in fulfilling their responsibilities. And the children are faithful to their parents. In Ephesians chapter 6, the first three verses. And I know that what I'm covering this evening is nothing new to you. I realize that. And the only way this sermon may be beneficial to people who aren't here today would be through now the means of the internet and watching it later. But if we, are, have, if we are reinforced in this and we teach it to our children, then our, teacher, then our children will teach it to their children. And their children will teach it to their children. And the more people that learn it, the more people that remember it, then the more this is work and the better our country will become. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Ephesians 6, verse 2. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. The idea of honoring your father and mother in part carries the idea of taking care of your mom and dad, having that level of respect for them and care for them. This was the whole Corbin issue that Jesus had to deal with. The Jews had set up a system where if you had a, young, a, 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 a person who had a mother and father, but he didn't want to give the money to them, he didn't want to take care of them, if he would donate the money and call it Corbin, say the word Corbin with it, then he would be released from his responsibilities to honor his father and mother. Released from his responsibility to provide for them. Now imagine any good God-fearing person trying to work that law into effect. But it's what they had come up with. Well, the idea of honoring your father and mother is much more than simply doing as they say. It is having a level of respect and honor for them. One that carries you through the end of their life. Where you're even there and willing to take care of them. And to provide for them. Because of what they had done for you. If our nation would get our homes in order... No matter what state it's currently in, if everybody would buckle down and be the best mom, be the best father, be the best children they can be, then a lot of the problems we're dealing with today would not exist. But there's something else we need to do. And that is this. We need to develop a respect for life. Someone says we have a respect for life. Look at all the protests. Okay, I'll grant you that. I really think they should have been protesting a lot more because there's a lot of number of other cases that fit what just happened, both black and white and other, um, other races. You look at statistics, it's often interesting. You see white, you see black, Hispanic, and then others. And it just, yeah, I don't know what the others are, but other races. You know, so you, you got all this, and people say, yes, we're, we're upset. But are we really upset? Is it because of a respect for life that we have gotten upset over these things? Because this has been going on a long time. How many protests take place every year just out of the sheer murders that take place? If you do a search for statistics of the rate of murder in the United States, you'll see a pretty high number. Where's the outrage over that? What does the Bible say about life? Well, let's look at a couple of passages here. We're talking about life has been given to us by God. And keep in mind, we're not talking about animal life. We're not talking about plant life. We're talking about human life. A life where there's conscience, there's consciousness, there's a soul, there's a spirit, there's intelligence. I mean, you think about everything that has been built in the world today. It wasn't built by dolphins. 
Think about the pyramids. Think about all the great achievements. Think about the, the, the discoveries in medication and the discoveries in science. Who's all done that? Well, man has. Not animals. And notice what God says. Let's look in Genesis chapter 9, and let's read verses 5 and 6. Surely, and, and this is, um, God is blessing Noah. This is after the flood. Gives them some information there, telling them, you'll now eat flesh, but, but not the flesh that has the blood in it. He says, surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it. From the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Now think about that. From the time of the flood, whoever sheds man's blood, by man's blood shall be shed. What does that tell us? It tells us the value of life. It tells us the value of life. Life is so important that if one man takes another man's life in the context of what we're looking at, then the only way to balance the scales, if you would, is for him to give his life as well. We're not talking about, well, if you take a life and then you're going to pay some money and it'd be okay. Or you take a life and, and, and you'll spend a little bit of time in jail, you'll be okay. Here is a like for like, and I believe the like for like illustrates the value of of that which was taken. Turn over to Exodus chapter 20 now, verse 13. Exodus chapter 20, and there are a lot of other passages we could look at, but these are just to kind of remind us that even the Lord views life as that which is valuable. In Exodus chapter 20 there in verse 13, the simple part of the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder. Okay, very simple, very straightforward. Then chapter 21, beginning there in verse 22, if men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. Now, there, there are some differing thoughts on this verse, and some translations take a, a completely different route with it. But I'm of the full uh, persuasion here, when it says, so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, that means no harm to the mother or the baby. Okay? She, she gives birth early. Well, there's a punishment that needs to be in fact, but it's up to the husband to, to determine what is imposed upon the one who brought this about. And he shall pay as the judges determine. But if any harm follows, and I believe that would apply to either the woman or the baby born prematurely, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand. There's a, there is a balancing of the scales. When a life is taken in an unjust fashion. And we see this throughout the scriptures. All life must be precious to us. If our nation is going to be a nation that is a great nation, life has got to be very precious. You know, it's one of those cases where we should avoid at all costs taking someone else's life. And if life is taken without just causes, then there needs to be consequences for that. It's that simple. But it doesn't matter the skin color. It doesn't matter the age. It doesn't matter the sex of the individual. When someone dies at the hand of someone else and it's an unjust cause, there needs to be an outrage over it. Not over one, two, ten cases. But there needs to be this outrage. And what should fuel the outrage is that we hold life to be incredibly precious because God has given it to us. This outrage should be seen with every senseless and unjustified death. Now I think for a minute, you know where I'm going next with this? If we were online, I'd say I'll give you 30 seconds to think about it and then type your answer in. What about abortion? This is why we need to have a respect for life. Now these numbers are better than they used to be. In 2017, this is according to Guttmacher, or however you would say that, Guttmacher or whatever. Anyway, in 2017, the number of abortions in the United States, think about this, were 13.5 number of abortions per 1,000 women, ages 15 through 44. So within that age bracket, in every 1,000 women, 13 and a half abortions took place pretty high number isn't it now it was worse 
They, the, the chart that I was looking at, it goes upwards the farther back you go. To 19, was it 73 with Roe versus Wade? Now, what happens here is they wrap this up into, it's not really about a respect for life, it's about the rights of the mother and her body. So, you can have, and, and there, there is a case of this point, you can have a well-known actress who has had, granted, this will be hearsay, but if the information's right, who's had two abortions in her past, and now has, had, has a couple children, and has gone livid over Mr. Floyd's death. Okay, where's the rage coming from? Is it because life was lost unjustly? Yes. Then why not before? What's the difference? And again, we try to wrap it up in legal ease. We try to talk about the rights of the woman's body um, and, and all that other stuff. And if we, if we have a respect for life, fundamental respect for life, we're going to say that all human life is of great value. And no one has the right, even if it's within their own body, to say, yes, I'm going to terminate your existence. It's that simple. Now, can you imagine where our, number, or where our world would be today if we had this level of respect for life? Yes, there'd be a lot more people in the world today. I have to feed more, more mouths, I guess. Because we're looking at the numbers of millions since the 70s, when all this took place. There's been more babies aborted, more human life terminated, than there were, from one set of statistics, than all the deaths of Americans in the various wars we participated in. So my point is, our nation needs to have respect for life. It's that simple. If we had respect for life, then we would begin to look at things differently. And yes, even, and I'll say even the death penalty would be viewed differently. If everybody in the country viewed life as something that is of value given by God, then the proper judgments could be made. And go back to what we saw. Our life is so valuable that there must be a life for a life. If it's not that valuable then what value is life? And then the last one, the last thing that our world needs to do, our nation needs to do, we need to learn how to work for a living. Now, you said, you're looking at me saying, I do work for a living, what are you talking about? I'm talking about just a general work ethic that needs to be established within the hearts of everybody. You know, whether you parent or your grandparent and guess what there's a lot of grandparents today raising kids as if they're theirs and a lot of those cases and you can talk to teachers who have taught in these situations you have a lot of cases that the parents ended up for whatever reason losing custody of the kids and grandma and grandpa gets to raise them and so here you have a couple in their 70s having to raise a, a 10 year old and it's so hard it is so hard to do and so what happens is somewhere along the way, someone quit instilling within people the importance of being a hard worker, working hard for a living. Um, our government in years past has created systems with the good intentions of helping those who don't have. Okay? And that's, that's a biblical principle. The children of Israel, when you were, when you were plowing the fields, anything that fell behind, you would have to leave it on the ground for those who were poor, they would come behind you and glean the field. But notice, they would have to come and pick it up. You didn't have a higher group of people to come pick it up and then hand them out to the people. You know, even Ruth, even Boaz says, you throw a little extra down there for Ruth. So we have set up systems in our country in good faith of trying to get people to have the help that they need when they're unable to work. But like everything, it becomes abused. And so we create a system where someone very well could say, if I play my cards right, I really don't have to work a day in my life. Not seriously, anyway. But what was it that God told Adam? Turn over to Genesis chapter 3 for just a moment. Genesis chapter 3. And, and you know, this is common sense stuff. It, it is common sense. If you were to do away... With, with our economic system that we have, our sociological system we have, that if you do away with all that, 
and we were, everybody was having to fend for themselves, what would happen if you didn't work? Well, you either would steal or go hungry. Pretty much that's the way it would work out. You would finally have to realize, I've got to work. I've got to get out there, and I've got to work hard. Well, when God was driving Adam and Eve out of the garden, what did he say to Adam in verse 17 of Genesis chapter 3? Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. And toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So we have to work. When I, the first time I was talking to my dad about getting a job, I was 14 years old. I wanted to find a job. He said, son, why do you want a job? Dad, I don't want to work and earn money. He says, you start working now, you're going to work until you die. Little did you know I'd become a preacher. So I kind of solved that problem. Um, <laughs> but you understand the point, though. And so I've tried to tell my kids. I even told Jeremiah. He said, he's wanting to get a job, and understandably so. But I said, to understand, once you start, and I told Micah this too, once you start, you're going to work until you retire. And it may be the next 50 years of your life. Maybe longer. But the point is you have to work. And our nation needs to remember that. Our nation needs to encourage people to work for a living, to be honorable in the jobs that they do. And don't be picky. I've, I knew of a, a cousin I had years ago, and I've used him as an example on many occasions. He went seven years without a job. His poor old wife had to do everything, including raising the kids while she worked a job, because he was holding out for that perfect position. He was a lazy bum. He was a lazy bum. Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. We're almost done. Consider what Paul is telling Christians. And understand, I realize, as Christians, we live by a higher standard. We really do. We live by God's standard. And so everything that I'm saying to you, you've heard this before, over and over and over again. But maybe we might be able to influence our friends in the world by sharing with them the same information. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. And, uh, in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, here we go, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you that you may walk properly towards those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. You see that? Let's work with our own hands. Let's mind our own business. Let's serve the Lord and walk properly towards those who are outside. Then we'll have what we need. And not only will we have what we need, we'll have to help those who do not have. There is a valid argument to benevolence, to us working so that we might have to help those who don't have. Paul says, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor with his hand working that he may give to those who don't have. Because there are, there are genuine cases out there where people who don't have, because they can't work, not because they choose not to work. Notice what the next verse says. This is 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. He goes on in the next letter. He says, for even, for even when we, read this right, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Apparently, as you go into the context here, some of these people were, had quit their jobs, or were, they were no longer working, and they'd become busybodies, meddling in other people's affairs. And so Paul says, you want to know how you deal with these people? If a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. It's that simple. And then... You would take extra measures in that case in point. You look on down to verse 16. But it seems harsh, doesn't it? It seems so cruel to say, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. But can you tell me any other way that this works? Is there any other way? If a person is unwilling to work, and that's the phrase there, if anyone will not work. It doesn't say if anyone can't work. If it, if it doesn't say if anyone is working two or three jobs, but he's still not making enough money, then, then, then tough. He says, if anyone will not work. And so, we, if we live in a world 
When you have a bunch of people who choose not to work, who choose to get out there and work with the labor, uh, with, with labor with their hands, and then they're hollering because they don't have enough food on their table, what should be our conclusion? A preacher um, I knew some years ago was telling me about a story. Um, and th this congregation would, would take food to, to uh, people who weren't Christians. And he told me about a case in point one time where they got a call. And, the, and I'll tell you what, you, 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 you help some people one time, even as individuals, and depending on the people, they'll come back to you because you become a source for them. But there's this family, they called up, this, my, this wife said, I oh, don't no, have no food, can't feed my family. Can, 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 can your church help me out? And most of the times, they're not members of the body of Christ. They just call a church. And so he said, okay. So he and one of the members went, they bought a bag of groceries and took it over there. And he said, when we got in there, yes, the woman was there, and there were two or three men sitting in, um, I want to call them wife beater shirts, but they're, um, you know what I mean, the white tank top shirts and everything. And drinking beers, watching the ball game. And that told him right then, this family, we can never help her again. Because it wasn't that they didn't have the ability to work, is that they were too lazy to work. And they were saying, well, other people will take care of us. Other people will come and provide for us. And it's those people that Paul's talking about when he says, if a man will not work, neither shall he eat. There's very few things that will, spark, that will uh, urge a person to work. Very few things will urge them as well as hunger. And once they learn the lesson, then that's when begin the self-discipline comes in. And then 1 Timothy 5, this one, of course, has to do with the supporting of widows uh, by the church. And specifically, a widow, indeed, can be supported by the church if she has no one else to provide for her. And here's what Paul writes. If there's no one else to provide for her, the church can provide for her. But notice what he says here. If she has family there to take care of her, and it's based on this principle. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Every father has a responsibility to provide for his family. Every mother has a responsibility to provide for her family. And every child. Think about honoring your father and your mother. When you are old enough and able to, every child has a responsibility of helping to take care of their family. Now, we live in a great nation today that our, our young people, you'll never be burdened with that. But I'm sure some of our older members could tell you that when they were kids, the first jobs that they got, they were about 12 or 13, made pennies, and it would go to their mom and dad because their mom and dad were struggling during the Great Depression and other time periods. And they, they the kids themselves, would work and have to turn the money over to their parents to help provide for their family. So this is a solid principle. Every family needs to be provided for, but it needs to provide for itself if at all possible. And this is what we're talking about. And I really believe that if this was practiced by at least half of our nation, if not more, then a lot of the problems we face today, even crime, would begin to go down. Even crime would begin to go down. Now, it's not a perfect system. I'll acknowledge that. Even with all these things in place right here, with a love of the Lord God, a loving of our neighbors ourselves, respecting the law of the land, getting our homes in order, respecting all human life, be willing to work, even with all those in place, there will still be issues and challenges. But consider how much farther along we will be in dealing with those than we would be if these things were not in place. As I said earlier, you know all this. You've heard this for years. And more than likely, your, your world of influence knows this as well. But I'm just telling you for anybody who would wonder about this, this is my suggestion on how the United States of America can begin solving our problems. But we focus on ourselves. We focus on our service unto God. Let's fix the problems at home first then we'll be in a better place to help others. And so if you're looking at this and in your own family, maybe you identify that there are areas that, that you need to work on, then work on it. 
If you need to increase your love for the Lord, maybe you've seen things in your life that suggest that you don't love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then fix it. Maybe you've seen actions within your life that suggest you don't love your neighbor as yourself, then fix it. Maybe if you've heard yourself do things, see yourself do things, that clearly shows you don't have respect for the law of the land, fix it. If your home is not in order, get it in order. If you have done things that suggest that maybe you don't respect all human life, change it today. Get the respect back. God found your life, your spiritual life, important enough to send Jesus to die. Surely we can view all human life as important. And maybe you're, you're not wanting to work. Get with the program. Get out there and work. You'll feel better about yourself. And as a Christian, you'll be doing as you're supposed to do. Now, if you're not a Christian, you need to become one. You need to become a child of God. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, why have you not yet acted on that? Be willing to repent of your sins. Walk away from those sins. Be buried with Him in baptism so you rise up to walk in newness of life. You need to do that today. If you are a Christian and you've not been living faithfully unto the Lord, then it's time to turn back. Repent and be restored back to His fellowship. If you're subject to the Gospel's call and invitation, come forward as we stand and as we sing.